typed. So it should be working. We're about to find out. We are. And let me. Does it say on my end? Uh, start streaming. Mm -hmm. Stop streaming. Yeah, it says. Uh, it looks like I'm streaming and recording. So I am opening up here. I'm hoping that everybody can see your stuff. <laughs> It, it, by the way, um, if anybody in my audience is, is already watching, um, just be aware that I'm a total boomer with this. So if you are sending me messages, I will not see them until after the stream. Um, and if you want to send me money, I, I will thank you afterwards. Um, though I would honestly prefer if you did anything uh, to go and support the um, the uh, Daruti 2 uh, benefit for Rezom for Ukraine, which is in link in the description. Okay, so Anark, what, are you are you going yet? It looks like I am. That's awesome. We are very professional streamers. <laughs> yeah, we're so professional. This is wild. Mine's like chugging though. Like here's the here's the link. You can tell me how that looks on your end. I think on my my end, it looks like it's chugging. So, um, hang on. I have you. Um, uh, this is gonna annoy everyone because it'll go. The. Oh, yep. I'm seeing this. There's the link to the live stream. Should I open this up? Yeah, I'm going to open this up and this will horrify everyone. Hang on. Uh, link will take you to... Yep, yeah, I want to go there. Let's see what we're seeing. Mine's like chugging, though. Like, here's the here's the link. You can tell me how that looks on your end. I think on my, my end, it looks like it's chugging, so... Chugging is in as in slowly? Yeah, it looks like it's got like a frame rate of like one frame per minute. Yeah, that's that's what I'm getting over here, too. Oh, yep. I'm Dang, I'm going to fix that. Um, open this hmm. up? Yeah, we open this well, up. it's not a hardware problem. Definitely some kind of hmm. up. upload speed. Oh, yeah, it's getting really bad connection here. Wow. The, I'm, I'm sure this, this is the, just like the hard-hitting content people need. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. I'm sure they're extremely excited about me having streaming difficulties. They're probably s sitting here like, oh, man, wow, will Daniel ever get us up to, like, two frames per minute? And that really, like, remains to be seen. Um... Oh, so I am live. Um, let me see. Oh, and now I'm just seeing... <laughs> I'm just seeing my thing from the inside. All right. So I'm going to close out of this. It doesn't look like mine's going super slowly, or at least based on my voice, it doesn't seem like that. So it's maybe on your end. What I'm seeing here is that your your uh, uh, panel is coming up gray. So I don't know what is happening. It's this is a uh, uh, my panel is gray bad. on your on your stream. Yeah, what? I can't I can't see you on mine. Yep, I've got we've already got someone in the chat. Siri, it's chugging on an arc's side. <laughs> Um, all it's right. definitely chugging on my side, no doubt about that. Although it's not my CPU, my CPU is only at thirty percent. It just it says that the upload speed is just ludicrously low. Hmm. And this is a, a welcome everybody. This is uh, what it looks like to troubleshoot a live stream. <laughs> um, it says it's dropping lots of frames, dropping a strong eighty four percent of all frames. Well, damn. Uh, uh, dropping frames live stream. Let's see. This program is forced drops in the I'm gonna move this up here just so that my my viewers can see my my beautiful face instead of like the forever <laughs> um, recording where it's it's recording it's recording it's recording itself you know. Right. Right. Let's see. Maybe it has something to do with the output. Maybe I need to lower the bitrate or something. Did that fix it? Um, let me take a look and see. Hang on. It looks like the drop frames are already plummeting. It's Excellent. Like they're already getting better. <laughs> we and are. That was that was a huge difference. That made a big difference, although definitely still get. 
Cool, cool. Very excited. And I, I got you into my headset now, so um, I don't think that was causing a problem. Hopefully the people on my uh, my channel uh, can hear both me and you. It, it, it should be good. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Huh. Let me, you know what, let me check and see something, because maybe it's the... <laughs> oh, it stopped? Oh, wow. What, what, what did you do? My... Then you can see me. <laughs> it's fine. People can splice it together later. You know, the, 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 legion, the legions of fans with video editing and time that we have. <laughs> oh. Uh, testing, testing, one, two, three, sibilance, sibilance, testing, one, two, three. Excellent. What's amazing is, is that you're still better than me, <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it... Yeah, absolutely. Um, just uh, in case you guys are just meeting me right now, my name is Brenton Lengel. Uh, I am a poet, playwright, uh, anarchist, and former uh, Ac Occupy Wall Street activist. Um, and I'm the creator of the Ringo Award-nominated comic series Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, which is actually in your local comic shops now. The third issue uh, should be out very soon. Um, but once I, you know, you know, got famous for doing a book about zombies and fairy tales, what do you do? Well, you go do a biopic about a famous anarchist. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, the writer creator also of uh, Darudi Shadow of the People. Um, this is one of my favorite covers, by the way, because we use his original um, uh, jail support photo. So yeah, um, I guess sort of where these two figures kind of came from. I've been obsessed with Darudi since I learned about him uh, back in, I think it was 2010, 2011. If I recall, it was right before Occupy Wall Street. And um, I was reading George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. Um, there's a whole video series where I do that chapter by chapter on my channel with uh, my co-host Bobby. Um, and... Uh, like, basically, I was reading in there, and the, George Orwell mentions a few times this group called Friends of Derudi. And so I'm like, well, who the hell is this Derudi guy? And I go and I look him up, and I'm just like, oh, oh, the holy shit, you know, this guy's like the coolest freaking guy I've ever, I've ever heard of. How in the world does no one know about? Oh, right, anarchist. <laughs> that explains everything. Um, 
So, you know, at the time I had started writing, a, I was working as a playwright in Manhattan. I've uh, beat my head against the wall there for 10 years straight. Um, and um, I was wor originally working on a play called No Gods, No Kings, uh, which was set in revolutionary Catalonia, um, like right on like the uh, on the line and centered around a couple of uh, anarchist fighters. Uh, but I realized while I was doing that, that I, I kept like jumping to Derudi's story. And I was like, no, I, I can't do that because that's a that's a film. So uh, basically, I uh, went from that to once I was able to start making comics, I, I you know, I'd already written a full film series about Derudi because, you know, the, the play, it felt like I was just rewriting Homage to Catalonia, you know, and I was just like, well, that already exists. So, uh, yeah, I adapted Derudi's uh, life, uh, as particularly like uh, the, the most dramatic point, starting with his um, incarceration after trying to uh, kill the Spanish king and, and failing in France, uh, all the way up until his death uh, in 1936. So, yeah, I mean, Derudi, if you, if you haven't heard of him before, uh, he started out as sort of a bandit and bank robber, kind of a, a Robin Hood figure um, in Spain in the early 1900s. Um, then he cut a swath of revolution across five countries and two continents. Um, and uh, when Spain's military went fascist, he took up the defense of Barcelona and defeated the military and, uh, you know, ushered in the anarchist control of Catalonia and revolutionary Catalonia in general, which is one of the two largest and most significant um, anarchist uh, movements and, and show of the power of anarchist organizing uh, that, you know, we can always point to when people say anarchy doesn't work, anarchism doesn't work, you know, it, you just point them straight at revolutionary Catalonia and they'll just ignore you and say it still doesn't work, but you will have at least <laughs> uh, put it in that direction. So that's Derudi. And then while I was researching his life. I, I read a number of books from a bunch of different sources. The, the primary one is this giant tome from AK Press. This is Derudi and the Spanish Revolution by Abel Paz. Uh, Abel Paz being uh, an anarchist, he was about 15, uh, and he wound up like fighting in the revolution um, after the anarchists were suppressed and the fascists uh, immediately, uh, you know, defeated uh, the Stalinists. Um, you know, he wound up as a political dissident and uh, was actually jailed, I believe, for a time uh, by the Franco uh, uh, regime. But, you know, once Franco died, he was able to come back and uh, put out these amazing critical uh, histories because he's also a historian. He's not just a, an activist and an anarchist. He's also a historian. Um, so, like, you know, there's a number of really wonderful books that AK Press has published in English here. Um, and, you know, those became kind of the, the center of the story. Um, so then, you know, we jump to Nestor Machno. Machno, uh, you know, I, I would assume you'd know him, but it, it, in case you haven't, uh, he was... Um, you know, very much like Derudi, uh, started out uh, as an anarchist radical in his early teens um, after his brother was uh, conscripted and sent to fight in Manchuria. Um, he wound up, you know, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about his life, but, you know, he went from, uh, you know, carrying out a bloodless expropriation of uh, the of the great landlord's property uh, within Gulyai Polye. Uh, his, his hometown. Um, and beyond that, what was really incredible about this was he also set up a number of, um, you know, communes based upon the stories that his mother had told him of his uh, Zapor Zaporog ancestors, the Zaporizhian Cossacks. So, you know, the another great history book to pull from, also from AK Press, is uh, Nestor Machno, Anarchy's Cossack. And holy... Like... Even if you've already like listened to the behind the bastards like deep dive on Machno, you you gotta go into this because it, his life is so much cooler and there's just so much to it that like it gets left out even you know in something like uh, you know Robert's deep dives because you know Robert Evans uh, behind the bastards I've been following his career since um, I guess uh, when he was just working at Cracked and. Uh, he did a very great deep dive, but like there's a lot he missed and didn't include or at least just wasn't able to include within the format, um, which we I, I guess we can get into 
uh, later on. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 two. Yeah, he does some incredible work in a weird way. He may actually be responsible for me being an anarchist today. Um, because I started out as a, uh, you know, cutting my teeth in the New York underground open mic scene. And uh, there was a friend of mine, a musician, uh, an artist that I really had a lot of respect for, uh, BZ Douglas of the BZ Listening Podcast, which is where you and I met. Um, and he was the one that turned me on to Robert's work from the beginning. And, you know, that was just before I moved in a very much an anarchist direction. And, you know, a, a big part of that was being friends with Beezy and also like, you, you know, just just following Robert's work, which is. Yeah. So, I, I Robert, if you're watching this, um, <laughs> you 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 bread pilled me <laughs> like indirectly. So, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal uh, thing. But like, yeah, even if you listen to that, like you owe it to yourself to like go back and actually read the book because th there is like so much stuff that was left out. Um but I'm, I'm kind of happy about it because maybe after I finish the Derudi series, uh, I will dive in and do like a Nestor Machno series, which, which yeah, because I mean, some of this stuff is just like, how, how do you not write that? <laughs> You know, th there's a lot of things. Um, one of the things that I think I, I have speculated, I'm working on a, sh a short film about his life that I'm going to put out. Um, and one of the things that I actually speculated upon was, yeah, he, he had this amazing ability to get out of just about every uh, incredibly dangerous situation he was within. You know, like th th this after the second time the Bolsheviks uh, betrayed him. Um, like he would let himself get encircled just to get the Bolshevik army to move like where he wanted it to go so that he could then break out and go do whatever he, he happened to be doing at that time. Um, and there were a number of times I noticed that like he would be under fire in these somewhat impossible situations. Um, and like, you know, the, the people shooting at him had basically stormtrooper aim. Um, <laughs> so there, there's two theories on that. Uh, one, Russians are really bad at war, which, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, but two, uh, and it could be a combination of this also, uh, I think really a lot of the, you know, rank and file Red Army soldiers just didn't want to, didn't want to kill him because they had fought side by side um, for so long. Uh, and it was known that if you were captured by Machno, like he, as long as you were a normal soldier, he just let you go. Like, you know, disarm you or, or, or give you the option to join uh, the Black Army. But, like, you got to think, you know, you're a Russian soldier at that time. You've been conscripted. You know, you've been sent down here. And now they're telling you you have to kill uh, the guys who fought side by side and, in fact, saved Moscow uh, from the White Army and defeated the White Army, like, decisively. So, you know, I, I just wonder... Is is that just Machno's genius? Is that just luck, uh, or is that an unwillingness on the part of you know the uh, the Russian proletariat uh, to carry out their orders and liquidate uh, the anarchists? Yep. Well, by the White Army and the Red Army, uh, I think, I think he. It, it, there's a bit in in Anarchy's Cossack where they're like, and yeah, he he sustained six gunshot wounds, but none of them were serious. And then a little while later, they're like, oh yeah, here's his eleventh gunshot wound. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah, absolutely. They they were also um, monarchists, uh, czarists as well. So. Yeah. Well, well, that whole thing, I mean, it was like a freaking Helm's Deep moment. It really was. Like, with, with Machno coming in, you know, Helm's Deep with sabers. <laughs> um, one of the cooler things, this well, I don't believe this was mentioned in the Behind the Bastards uh, episode, um, but, like, there's this whole bit where, during that battle, the white army soldiers, like, particularly the brass, when they're running from the anarchists, they said that, like, the fields of uh, the town of Perignovka, uh, like, had this uh, strange crop of golden epaulets. So basically, like, the soldiers are there, they're getting, you know, uh, they're, they're getting hit with this, like, cavalry charge, and the anarchists are throwing, like, frickin' grenades at them, and then coming back in with sabers, and, you know, they're, so they're just, like, tearing their epaulets off, throwing them and running. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, what's interesting about that one, too, is, is it wasn't just the defeat there that um, kind of cemented the, the end of the White Army, because a large portion of the White Army was a, a, within 200 kilometers of Moscow. Like, you know, Lenin and Trotsky and stuff, they're, they're in there, like, getting ready to uh, freaking flee to Finland, con kind of congratulating themselves. Well, we made it longer than the Paris Commune. Um, and then Machno uh, wound up, uh, he basically took the, the another sec segment of the White Army and continually attacked them and retreated and retreated and retreated, uh, what, which is called trading space for time. So he was inflicting casualties on the White Army, but constantly giving ground for over 600 kilometers until they, you know, chased them to uh, Perignovka, um, at, at which point the Whites had him trapped and he was basically like, okay, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. This is where we, we do our final stand. And not only, like, it was amazing, it w was amazing that he just destroyed that one army. But here was the thing. Because he had stretched there so thin, every bit of the white army's um, uh, logistics supply uh, was massively underguarded. And so with Machno's ability, took his remaining 7,000 troops, split them into three factions, and basically hit the whites everywhere that they were, where they were mostly undefended because everybody thought like that the armies in the front, you know, the Red Army wasn't going to make it past them and hit their supply lines. And they thought for sure they're going to, you know, squash this uh, anarchist rabble, um, you know. And instead, like, he basically took out, you, you know, took out their lifeline. It's like kind of stamping on an army's lungs, <laughs> you know. So, um I, that was what forced the white army when the generals are sitting there like arguing with each other like who's going to um you know be the first into moscow and have that glory suddenly they're like oh shit we've got to re we have to retreat and they wound up going like all the way back to their immediate power base and like literally i think it was taganrog like the anarchists were at the gates of their head like their major regional headquarters and that was halfway through the war <laughs> Yep, correct. <laughs> I 
I mean, so I, what I say in Darudi number two, um, just so folks, um, yeah, I have adapted his life into part of Darudi because, you know, I'm, I'm writing Darudi, and one of the cooler things about his story is that there's these weird, like, synchronicities with comics. Um, one of them, for instance, being that uh, Buenaventura de Rudy uh, had a number of anarchist groups, and one of them was known as Los Justicieros, which roughly translates to the Avengers. Which means <laughs> Buenaventura de Rudy, as he predates Marvel Comics, he's quite literally the first Avenger. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah, so I'm reading about that. You, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to play this up, and. Um, <laughs> From there, like when I found out about his meeting with Nestor Machno, and I knew I, I found out who Machno was, I was like, "Wait, a he had a crossover, <laughs> like in a freaking real life comic book style crossover with a literal Winter Soldier, <laughs> because Machno fought in Russia and Ukraine in winter in like negative four degrees." <laughs> So yeah, we we've got the first Avenger teaming up with the Winter Soldier, and I'm just like, okay, okay, uh, all right, this this is a story that I was meant to tell. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, anyway, you were t asking about like Machno, like uh, basically like how much of it was his, yeah, how much of it was his genius. I mean, part of it would have been uh, he was raised on stories of his Cossack ancestors. Um, if people don't know who the, the Zaporizhian Cossacks were, like, they were originally escaped serfs that built uh, a community, like, on the windswept steppe. Um, and they defended and lived free and proud, you know, by the power of the horse and saber. Um, and in fact, like if you look at a lot of modern uh, anarchist uh, ways of organizing the General Assembly in particular, like that's how the Cossacks, uh, you know, organized their society. They were also, uh, you know, they lived in total equality between genders um, and like, um, uh, you know, and every single person, you know, within the Cossack society could speak and they had an equal vote and equal say in everything that went on. So, um, you know, Machno was told about that growing up and also how, you know, they, for 200 years, the Zaporizhian Cossacks defended themselves against multiple impossibly powerful enemies on every side and managed to remain free and proud. That is until, uh, the, the old order came crashing down around them, uh, again under, in the form of the jeweled boot heel of Catherine the Great. So, you know, you had essentially escaped slaves building their own, uh, you know, um, horse-based society um, and then getting re-enslaved and then you know when the when serfdom was abolished uh, Machno was only one generation away from that so yeah so so his mother for instance like had been a serf his father had been a serf um, he, he was born after the end of it but you know as, as you guys know if you've seen Behind the Bastards you know, they're, they were free in name only because their, yeah, their, their land didn't produce enough food to feed a family of, I think, five boys and at least three girls, um, Nestor being the youngest. So, like, right after Nestor was born, his father had to go, like, beg his former owner to go back to work for him so that, you know, he could keep the family from starving. And the incredibly tragic thing about that is, is even after doing something like that incredibly humiliating it didn't really even count for anything because he died, you know, when Nestor was only 11 months old. So, you know, Nestor never knew his father. Um, I feel like definitely within those stories, um, he, he definitely learned anarchist or anarchistic organizing principles um, and most likely learned a whole bunch of, like, just what could work militarily based upon this oral history. Um, so I thought, I think that was part of it. I also think that like Machno, there, in a way there's like no one who could have done what he did, but Machno, not because a person wouldn't be capable of doing that, but just the very particular circumstances of Machno's life lined up in just this sort of perfect way that he was able to, uh, you know, bring his genius to bear, um, in, in a number of really incredible situations. So, yeah, I think Machno was probably 
so th- this is not in the Behind the Bastards thing, and it's a shame, or at least uh, I may have forgotten it, but it, it's it's a shame that it didn't make it in. Um, because, like, so Machno, um, when he was first imprisoned um, in, in his, like, late teens, he, he was sentenced, they'd done some revolutionary activity, I think they carried out some assassinations, and so he was, uh, you know... Set, he was captured with a number of other anarchists and, you know, sent to uh, sent to prison. He was he was uh, sentenced to 11 years in prison and also death by hanging. And he was in there with a number of other anarchists, including some older ones. And this uh, other comrade of his, Igor Bondarenko, who was sentenced as part of the thing, said, you know, look, Nestor, like, I will die here, um, but you you will live and the revolution will set you free. And when it does, you must raise the black flag of anarchy and put an end to the social disorder that is plaguing our people. And then when Machno and the other anarchists and other prisoners there kind of um, pushed back on this, and they were like, you know, Bondarenko, like, what are you talking about? Machno, he's small. He's not particularly strong. He's not some sort of genius. Like, what do you mean he's going to, um, you know, he, he's going to be the one to raise the black flag of anarchy? And Igor responded that it was not great strength or great genius. Uh, what was needed was unfailing faith and dedication to the cause of, of liberty. And that and that alone is what was needed. And he, he, he saw that Machno did not shrink before their torturers because, you know, they're in prison, you know, in, in Ukraine and, in, you know, the early 1900s, they're getting tortured and on a daily basis this is a very brutal society. And Machno is just taking it. And, and he's he, he's not wincing. He's not being broken by the people that are doing that are wreaking this awful physical violence on his body. And that indicor, indicated to um Igor that like he had the metal to actually become this person and so like every single thing that Igor said would happen happened you know he and as he was like being led away to be executed he's saying the same thing to Machno he's like I'm gonna die here I'm gonna die today you are going to live and you will regain your freedom and you know, the revolution came along, and after nine years in that prison, um, Machno was set free. And so when he returned to his, uh, you know, uh, his, his hometown of Gulyai Polye, uh, he was like the man who had returned from death. He was, yeah, he was like 27, maybe 29 years old at this point. And the fact that, you know, you've already gone through that, like... When the Russian Revolution hits and the social breakdown starts to happen, like not only does Machno become a um, you know an obvious center of gravity because he's been set apart from the other uh, revolutionaries, um, but like he's completely fearless because obviously, <laughs> you know he's what 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 could happen to you after that, <laughs> you know, um, and so he wound up becoming like this really incredible leader. Um, and then I think it was just a, a combination of his background, um, also his, his military style, because, you know, we, we give Machno a lot of the credit on this, but it really wasn't just Machno. Um, you know, the, in their communes, it, they had the general assembly and in their, and in military matters, they had the war council and every single unit was represented in the war council and they all had, you know, an equal vote into what they were going to do. So it wasn't simply that Machno was a genius and he definitely was. Um, but it was also that he had, he had the minds of everyone else around him working to pull off this collective action that, uh, you know, which I don't think would be possible for one human mind, no matter how brilliant, but the fact that you've got all of these people together, it, it's just like, I, I think that uh, evolution in a lot of ways is based upon the principle of synergy. And I think in a lot of ways that, that, that anarchist, especially anarchist democracy, is applying the principles of synergy to um, politics and to war. And as we've seen with Machno and with Deruti, this this really works because, you know, uh, just like with swarm intelligence that we have today, 
a, a, a large, large group of people where everyone is respected and everyone is listened to uh, can contribute to a collective work in a way that, you know, a bunch of people commanded by just a few elites simply can't. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, I mean, are you talking Spain or, or Ukraine? I mean, the Black Army was an army. Um, it was, yeah, it was a hundred thousand strong peasant army at, at times. It, it fluctuated between, you know, two to five thousand all the way up to like over a hundred thousand. Um, I think at their absolute strongest, it was like when they had 80,000 people. And so it was like, 30,000 on the front line doing the fighting and then 80,000 who were able to like come in and either do logistics work or swap out when uh, some, some, someone on the front line had died and, you know, get their weapons. Because if there's one story uh, from uh, anarchists uh, and one big lesson is that um, we are always finding ourselves like at a dearth of weapons and that has been like a major major problem in just about every conflict um Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there there is some in it. Um, so one of the, um, I guess, one of the things that actually Machno said to Daruti, um, and, you know, again, he was trying to instill as much um, uh, he was trying to instill as much as he could on Daruti because, like, in the meeting that I wrote for Daruti's Shadow of the People number two, um, you know, this takes place in Vincennes, uh, where Machno, you know, he's he's in his 40s at this point. Um, Daruti, uh, is in, at this clandestine meeting between him, uh, Daruti Escaso, and a guy by the name of Gregorio Hover, um, who in my series I have combined him, uh, with um, Oliver, uh, Oliver being because Oliver is like the third member of Daruti's band, but at this point they hadn't linked up, so just uh, smashed those two together <laughs> as a character. Um, though, also in the second issue of Daruti, if if you look at the um, Machno gives them uh, like some, uh, he, he they give them forged passports to get back into Spain. And if you look, because each of the passports has uh, a false name on there, and I used like the actual aliases that they had used for this. Um, but if you look on uh, Oliver's, it, the name on it is Gregorio Hover. <laughs> um, yeah, which is just like a, a nice little flourish. I'm happy about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big fan of that. Like with my work, just I love the six person jokes, and there, there's stuff in the comics that like only I am going to get, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, but um, so the thing is, is that what Machno said specifically was that the key to their strength 
um, was that everyone worked. Like, the reason that they did not wind up collapsing into, you know, more authoritarian models where a, an overclass of officers or owners or, you know, just big, grand, powerful elites didn't... Oh, it was because everybody had to do, like, all the work together and they all shared it. Um, and that was how they managed uh, to not have a ruling class emerge. Um, what's really... What I find really interesting about it is the fact that, you know, in Machno's, um, you know, communes, like the first ones that he set up, and they, they had problems. Uh, a lot of them will be ones that anarchist organizers will be familiar with, like if you read, you know, the biography about it. But what was really incredible about that was, you know, oftentimes in civil wars, especially like massive class conflict, it gets messy and bloody very quickly. You know, um, people who have power, there's just some like reptile part of our brain that once you've got power, you don't want to give it up. Um, and oftentimes this leads to, to huge tragic consequences. Um, that did not happen in the communes that Machno set up. And what was really incredible was, was that in these communes, like they gave the, the wealthy people a choice, you know, rather than just lining them up and executing them as the Bolsheviks would have and did, you know, um, they essentially were like, look, you know, you, we, we are collectivizing this property that you used to own. Um, you can go do what you want, or, you know, if you want to, you can join us and for an equal share in everything that the community does. And, a number of them accepted that, and many came came around to like view things like from Machno's point of view. Because as it turns out, you know, having a bunch of money and power isolates you and kind of yeah drives you crazy and makes you miserable. So it, it is the physical act of laboring together that made like these uh, particular organizations uh, first, you know, civilian then military. Um, you know, as successful as they were, because, you know, as a human, when you are a part of a community working together on a project that is bigger than yourself, you know, and you're not being exploited, you know, uh, even no, no matter how difficult things may get, the people around you are feeling it just as much as you have. Turns out that's just a way more fulfilling way to live uh, than, you know, to, to be a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Mhm. Mm oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Now, you know, what's very interesting is, so uh, if you guys have followed my work for a while, I've been accused of being uh, a, a method writer um, in that, you know, like method actors will go and try to live a role like, you know, Daniel Day Lewis going before he did The Crucible. He was like on set building houses <laughs> and stuff. Um, usually when I write something, I, I try my best to get as close to living that as possible before I do my creative work. Because um, I feel that's very, very important. That you, you, There's something, there's a difference between understanding something on a intellectual or, or, or you know, um, I guess a hypothetical level and then actually like living the reality of it. It's, it's one of the reasons, it wasn't the, the reason I got involved with Occupy Wall Street. I got involved with Occupy Wall Street because I believed, uh, you know, in the the movement and what we were standing for what we were trying to do to accomplish um you know but by doing that um you know i got to take play i got to take part in a lot of general assemblies um you know ows um it's been somewhat forgotten but that was absolutely an anarchist movement i mean mark bray uh went through and like i think it's like 73 to 75 percent of occupiers identified as some sort of anarchist or left libertarian um, so like by living that with Occupy and then not simply being like how the park functioned, cause there, there were a lot of massive lies about the way things were going on in the park. Um, you know, for instance, uh, the NYPD used as an excuse to attack the, the idea that they needed to clean the park. This was ridiculous. Like, the park was clean. Um, we had an entire sanitation working group specifically because we knew that if we didn't, like, you know, they would do exactly what they did. I had actually wound up finishing like a, um, I had just done a fundraiser for um, the, uh, the, uh, for the sanitation working group, like at the Yippie Museum uh, in Lower Manhattan. And the very next day, you know, I woke up and my wife is like, oh, you know, Brent, you're, you're going to be mad about this. Um, and I'm like, what happened? So I've even seen like other an uh, other like activists will adopt the sort of mythology that Occupy couldn't function and fell apart due to it being um, decentralized and winter coming in. That is one. Th yeah, that is one thousand percent not what happened. What what happened was the NYPD originally declared they were going to clear the park. And when the park, when, when they got together to try to clear the park, 2,000 people came down and stood shoulder to shoulder to oppose them. And they backed down. It was one of the only times this happens with activist groups. Is you get the freaking boots on the ground and you get those people ready to, you know, take on the police and the police will back down. Um, you know, so then... Shortly thereafter, um, what happened was, was it was a raid in the middle of the night, unannounced. Um, Bloomberg, like, called the head of the New York Times and made sure, like, got their assurance that they would take his side in this clearing. I mean, and, you know, the freaking, he sent his freaking stormtroopers in to pull my friends out of their beds, you know, beat them. And uh, they intimidated journalists on the ground, arrested a number of them, kept them away. And they even uh, deployed a helicopter to prevent coverage of the raid, you know, from the air. Afterwards, you know, the NYPD's footage of that got leaked, but it, it, it was leaked after the movement was already destroyed. And so, like, you know, people were just, like, going with the, the, um, the narrative that was being pushed from absolutely left, right, and center, every media organization in the country that, you know, we just couldn't function and no one knew what our demands were. By the way, just on that, and I did, I did, you know, like 10 years ago, I confronted a reporter on this because he was doing the same thing. Like, oh, what, what were Occupy's demands? I'm like, okay, you know, one month in, the General Assembly uh, published, uh, approved and published the Declaration of the Occupation of Zuccotti Park, where we put out like a 17-point plan of demands, and they just ignored it and kept going like, what are your demands? What are your demands? <laughs> so... 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to get like completely off uh, the thing, but like my, my point being is, is that if you want to learn how anarchistic principles function in real life, you got to go live it. You've got to do it. You like uh, Rudolf Rocker, I think to Rudy uh, or Scasso paraphrased him by saying, we make the road by walking it. Um, and in a lot of ways, like that's what Machno did. Like you, you talk about like, you know, how did he come up with the Tachanka? Well, he was faced with an army of uh, 700 professional soldiers, most of them Austro-Germans. He had 30 men and the, the population of this one village. Um, and, you know, these guys were getting ready. They were encamped. And the next day they were going to go in and they were going to capture and execute Machno and probably kill close to everyone in that town for harboring Machno. You know, because at this point, you know, he's basically Robin Hood. Um, and so what, what has he got? He's got 30 fighters. He's got some peasants who aren't fighters. Uh, and he has uh, a, a horse cart, a, a Maxim gun, a heavy machine gun, and a Lewis gun, which is a light machine gun. So he takes the, uh, you know, he takes the um, Maxim gun, puts it on a horse cart. Very natural thing to do. He takes up the Lewis gun himself, gets on his horse, and they flank the encamped enemy from both sides. And the combination of surprise and those automatic weapons being used in a way that automatic weapons had never been used at before. Normally you would like hunker down and, you know, shoot from a, a position, but this, you know, it's being used in a mobile way where you can just bring it in and, you know, uh, unload on them, sent this 700 army in like full retreat by, you know, yeah, like 30, 30 people, 35 people, something like that. Um, so uh, like, and then of course, you know, after the officers ran first, followed by the enlisted, um, and those that could, like they dispersed, they fled into the woods and the inhabitants, uh, of that village, um, followed them with fricking torches and pickaxes, <laughs> like, you know, um, uh, so they either ran or were defeated. But I mean, so in Deruti Shadow of the People number two, when I have this meeting, you know, between Buenaventura Deruti and Machno, Deruti's sitting there, like looking at a picture of him with his Tachanka. And he's just like, um, you know, Machno says, uh, like, Deruti says to Machno, like, re referencing the Tachanka, he's like, uh, you invented it. And Machno is like, well, I, I'd say necessity invented it. Um, you know, yeah, we, we anarchists, um, you know, have strong hearts, uh, but very little else. And so we must learn to improvise. So, yeah, I mean, I guess necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> Yeah, but but by living that life, by by doing what he did, in the way that he did, it, like that's what. It, it, one of the things that this is in the comic, and it's also like something Machno actually said, um, was that he said like, "Don't let people who think anarchism is a philosophy closed to life destroy it." Um, Anarchists are neither sectarian nor dogmatic. We do not have a predetermined worldview. Rather, ours is a force which um, uh, expresses itself within uh, the march of history. We are the force that drives it forward. So, you know, Machno as a theorist, you know, was a very kinesthetic theorist um, in much the way that, you know, Rudolf Rocker was and Deruti was. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think on both ends, there's there's a lot to be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's like the same thing with, um, you know, honestly, the same thing with Ukraine. Um, I think part of the reason that there's so much focus on Machno as a singular figure is just his his story is so freaking nuts. Like, th there's there's a moment. This is this this feels to me like if you took a Robin Hood movie and a D and D campaign and like freaking. Well, I'll tell you what the re the the other part that's fused with after I explain what happened. So this is um, during the Austro-German invasion of Ukraine. So it's really before the Whites and the Reds are slugging it out. Machno is essentially living like a Robin Hood kind of bandit in, in you know in in the uh, in the forests of the steppe. Um, and so like he they they attack this um, unit. Uh, like it's basically like a small unit of um, Austro-German soldiers, and they kill them. Um, and after they go through it, they find this letter on like the commander, and the letter was inviting the commander to this like freaking uh, you know fancy soiree at the at, at, like the home of a wealthy collaborator, you know, that was within the area. So Machno and his best guy, they take their uniforms, put them on, and show up at this party as these guys. And so, you know, they get welcomed in. There's all, like, the, the uh, occupying, you know, brass uh, along with, like, you know, the rich people who are collaborating with them. And supposedly during the, during the dinner, like, they go up to toast, like, oh, and here's, may you very soon, you know, capture the, the bandit Machno. At which point, Machno reveals himself and throws a freaking bomb on the table. He's, like he is Bugs Bunny, <laughs> and yeah, and, it, and and I know I know that that is true, and you know how I know that's true. <laughs> that anyone making something up would not make that up, <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, as a as an artist, like, you know, if, if I was coming up with Mach No Whole Cloth, I would never write anything like that. And I think at the same time, like, as a propagandist, if you're trying to, you know, either... Uh, if, if you're trying to move people one way or another, you don't tell that story. Because, yeah, immediately the, the response is, really? So, I, and I really think, I, you know, that's one of the reasons, like, why I, I'm, I'm pretty certain a lot of these stories about him are true, and those that are exaggerated are maybe far less exaggerated than they seem. But, yeah, so, Derudi and the, the Spanish anarchists, I mean... What was really interesting about Derudi was that, like, one of the other series that I'm working on right now is uh, Los Errantes, and I'm also writing a film, uh, or I'm sorry, I've written a film, uh, and we're in the funding process of it. We've actually gotten about half of what we need uh, with Enon Films. These are the, the folks I've been working with. Um, they optioned the Derudi script, and then they commissioned me to write this other uh, film, this one's called Wanderer's Feast. And, like, Derudi, what was incredible about him was, you know, he started at 17 joining the Metal Workers Union. You know, he, he his parents had wanted him to be, like, an intellectual. And he, and he was like, no, I want to be a worker like my dad. Um, so eventually they uh, apprenticed him to a radical socialist blacksmith named Melkor Martinez. And Melkor said, like, you know, oh, OK, I'll teach your son to be a master blacksmith and mechanic, but like, I'm also going to teach him to be a socialist. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they were all like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Because, you know, this that was what the family was all about anyway. Um, so then, like, at 17, Daruti after he's, he's joined the Metal Workers Union and he's striking in solidarity with the powerful and, straight, like, Aust- Asturian miners. And, you know, in 1917, like, the Asturian miners, so just a little after, I guess he's, like, 18 or 19 at this point, um, the king gives the order to machine gun the Asturians uh, to, uh, to kill as many of them as they need to kill to get them back to work. And so shortly thereafter, Daruti receives his draft notice. And so, like, he, he basically the same government he saw just use their military to kill his friends is like, hey, you have to join this military now. And so Daruti famously said, you know, the king will have one less soldier and one more uh, revolutionary. And he made good on that. So, you know, there's a period where he's going back and forth across the border between France and Spain, doing a lot of radical organizing, expropriations, you know. And then he has this whole period where he's going from country to country. I mean, Spain, France, uh, Cuba, Mexico, Argentina. And, um, like, there's just these incredible things that happened while he was there. The, The first Wanderer's Feast comic is about when he was trying to organize workers on a sugar plantation in Cuba. Um, And um, it's, you know, straight up like a real story about him where, like, you know, uh, the, the, he's sitting there trying to organize them. He gets them to strike. The boss comes out basically and berates the workers about, he knows that, you know, these, they've come under the sway of certain individuals they definitely should not be listening to. Um, and then they pulled, and you know, obviously Dury and Ascaso, they're sitting there like, uh oh, is this guy on to us? And he just brings out like three random guys, and they've been beaten like half to death. And he's like, okay, does anybody else want to complain? Now get back to work. You know, the the, the money you've wasted is going to be deducted from your pay. So, Derudi, Ascaso, and Hover, uh, you know, when the sun comes up, this guy has been uh, brutally killed <laughs> with. Um, uh, cane knives and his car has been stolen <laughs> and that's Derudi in them all they, they left uh, things calling themselves uh, Los Errantes which is the Wanderers you know the, the other film that I'm writing about for instance it, it, there's a real it's based on a real incident in Derudi's life um, about where he like shows up in um, Tampico Mexico and he's arranged to have a meeting with this uh, union activist from the CGT and Derudi's like, okay, you know, this is after he's stolen half a million dollars from the Bank of Spain and knocked over quite a few others. Um, and the guy's like, the, the meeting is going to be held at this, like, really uh, ritzy, like, the, the finest restaurant in all Tampico. And the organizer's kind of like, I don't know, like, I, I want, like, I feel like it's not right for me to go here to this place that's like in the upper, you know, echelons of luxury. You know, I'm an anarchist. I'm a, I'm a revolutionary. But also, like, I really want to eat there. <laughs> so he goes and he finds Daruti. And Daruti's there in the in the restaurant, like, under an assumed name. And he's just, like, almost like the center of everything. Like, everybody thinks he's a wealthy uh, miner, like a mine owner from Peru. And, like, he's just sitting there and he's like, you know, uh, and the guy's like, he's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm undercover, obviously. Like, the cops are tearing through the slums right now trying to find me. I'm just hiding in plain sight here. Um, And the cool thing about that story is, you know, the guy is an educator um, and he wanted to set up a fairer school. Um, So Darudi asked him at one point in the meeting, he's like, you know, what would you do if you had 100,000 pesos? And the guy's like... I don't know. If I had 100,000 pesos, I'd start my school. But but that's a dream, Daruti. And Daruti's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And, you know, they and they have their dinner. They go their separate ways. And about a week later, this guy gets a package in the mail. It's 100,000 pesos. Uh, Daruti had robbed a textile plant uh, to get the money <laughs> to give to this guy to build his school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I I one hundred percent agree. I mean, you you've also got to understand like the the context that Derudi and Machno lived in is something that like I don't think anyone in the first world can even imagine today. You know, Machno he and his fellow they were subjected to daily beatings. You know, by their so called betters who had just one generation owned. So you know, you think if you're an American, you know, think about like the Jim Crow South. Um, like, and it, like immediately after, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the fall of the Confederacy, uh, you know, once the Union Army leaves, you got to think how brutal is that society going to be? Because it was certainly brutal before that and nothing's changed at this point other than the legal designation. Uh, but a lot of the class relationships were still there. Um, you know, in Derudi's time, like... Employers would do this thing. Um, they would create these what was called yellow unions, which was a union that they controlled that you were forced to join if you went to work for them. So that was your union, so that they, they the CNT Phi, you know, wouldn't come in and organize with you. Um, the thing about these unions was also uh, you the, the the owners hired uh, what was called pistolerismos. Uh, these essentially are assassins. They are hired to be in the union and pretend to be a worker. And what they're supposed to do is listen for uh, any, like, talk of striking or rebellion or any kind of organizing. And their job is, when they hear that, to take that guy out back and shoot him in the head. You know? Like, there's a bunch of awful, uh, you know, abusive practices, you know, that go on. You know, even stuff like, uh, you know, Killer Coke like where Coca-Cola hired, uh, you know, basically fascists to murder union leaders in, in Nicaragua. But like even that really does not touch on just how brutal Spanish uh, and Ukrainian society was at that point in history. Um, you know, like people are, people have said to me like stuff like, oh, is there going to be a revolution soon? And I'm like, no, not not likely or a civil war, you know, and they're like, well, well why not? And I'm like, well... Because, like, in Spain, the landowners literally hunted people. <laughs> like, the, the, the sons of them, they called it, I think this was after the war broke out, but, like, just to see, like, the level of dehumanization and class uh, antagonism uh, that was going on in Spain at the time. Like, you know, um, it, like, these people would basically grab these peasants, um, you know, and they called this uh, Reforma Agregaria. Uh, which was, you know, mockingly called land reform, where they would, like, chase this frickin' peasant down on horseback, back, murder him, and dump him in a hole, and be like, okay, there's, there's that little patch of earth you always wanted. So, like, you know, a lot of the time, people from our time look back at the actions of um, activists and, you know, people, militants like Derudi and like Machno, and they either think one of two things. They either think, okay, that's the way you be an activist, you know, um, or they think, like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. These people must be insane. And neither is correct. What you just have to understand is that they they were products of their time and products of their society that, that put them in this position to begin with and kind of made uh, extreme methods like that, um, you know, both effective and uh, unfortunately sometimes uh, necessary. Um, but like, you know, if you want to see like modern expropriation, you know, I, I, I would say go watch The Take by Naomi Klein uh, about the uh, recovered factories movement in Argentina, um, where, where m much much more humane modern tactics are, go are being used. And there's even an element of putting pressure uh, on the government to uh, do this. But like, the the point being is is that you know don't if you're a revolutionary you know right now don't be thinking 
what did the revolutionaries in the past do? How do I do exactly that? You know, you really want to take into account the entire history of, you know, anarchist movements. And that includes people like Derudi and also like people like frickin' Tolstoy, you know? Um, Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm, no, I, I think you're a thousand percent right. It's important to understand, like, um, so like Spain, for instance, you know, they... they the Francoist regime was the second time Spain had been ruled by fascists. And before that, it, you know, it was ruled by a monarchy. So the, the second Spanish Republic, because I think it went like monarchy, republic. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that was what, monarchy, republic, uh, the fascist uh, dictatorship of Primo de Rivera. Uh, followed by the Second Spanish Republic, uh, followed by the fascist insurrection, where, uh, you know, Franco and a number of the other generals, Mola, for instance, you know, uh, tried to take over the country. You know, in a lot of ways, this is... I, I was on um, This Is Revolution, and they asked me, they said, like, you know, um, with Trump and the alt-right and the rise of, like, fascist... Like, do you think that that is happening again? And I sort of answered it with, um, you know, uh, Car I think Karl Marx, when he was paraphrasing um, Hegel, was that like each historical uh, movement and personage appears essentially twice, the first time as a tragedy and the second as farce. Um, yeah, so like the, the Spanish Revolution, like the reason why the fascists were stopped in Barcelona and, you know, uh, General Godet was captured, put on trial, executed, and Derudi took his army of 10,000 anarchists to fight, to fight Franco in Madrid l while the entire area was, you know, that was because the anarchists had been organizing and 
had these systems built, not simply to fight fascists, but to feed people, you know, and to keep the power running and to keep the water going and sanitation, you know, um, they had the ability to run not just one city, but the entire Argonne Front. They had that level of solidarity. And there was a level of, of natural political consciousness among the, the peasantry um, and the the proletariat in um, Spain that like even Nestor Machno, when he when he was talking to Rudy about this, he was like, you know, the conditions in Spain are better than they were in Ukraine. Like, you know, you the Iberian anarchists, you have deeper roots among the peasantry, and that's going to foster a stronger sense of solidarity and organization, you know, but you've got to fight hard to keep that. Um, and, you know, they did you know, for three years, you know, they managed uh, to not only hold on to their territory, but, you know, to go on the attack and to keep things running. And it really wasn't until they were suppressed by the Stalinists that that society started to break down. You know, a lot of people don't realize this, but like the uh, the the Bolsheviks, the commun the, the communists, the Bolsheviks, the big C communists, like when they took over, they were an anti-revolutionary force. They specifically worked to turn control of uh, the collectivized farms and, and businesses back to the capitalists that owned them. You know, uh, Stalin was interested in political control. He was not interested in revolution. Um, you know, and then uh, he got around to promptly losing the war after, you know, attacking his own allies. Similarly, like if you if you look at you know, if you really read um, about Machno and the Russian Revolution and stuff, you're going to find uh, tankies often will be like, oh, obviously Marx-Leninism works and it's the best thing because they won their revolution and they beat their, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they defeated the forces of reaction. So first, no, they didn't. Um, Machno defeated the forces of reaction twice. There, there, there would never have been a USSR without Machno and the Black Army, um, you know. And essentially, what they wound up doing was they bided their time, and betrayed Machno at two key junctures. Uh, the first time, uh, because Trotsky met him and got this really weird, irrational hatred for him that almost doomed the Bolsheviks, um, you know. And then the second time, uh, the anarchists were unfortunately. It's it's funny in. Um, I've got a page in Anarchy's Cossack because I always make notes like while I'm reading something to, you know, so I can just go back and find it. I got like, there's this one page and I'm just like, Machno, you have to stop saving people who want you dead. <laughs> like, Machno had some like some Ned Stark energy at times and it was it was very unfortunate. But yeah, I think the biggest mistake that the anarchists made in Ukraine was. One, they were a little too radical for anyone else to arm. Um, and then two, and this th this was the biggest thing, like um, they assumed that the Bolsheviks had a, either a level of humanity similar to theirs or that um, e even if the Bolsheviks were, you know, completely, you know, evil sociopaths, that it would be politically impossible for the Red Army to start fighting them after they just won the war for them. Um, yeah, and that, <laughs> that's not true. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I, yeah. 
Yeah, or or to just look what Putin's doing right now, you know? I I remember years ago, um, there was... uh, I I saw this... It wasn't really a meme, because this was before there were memes, but somebody had... uh, created like a series of pictures of like world war two, like where it's like, they're all gamers in a, uh, real time strategy game. And, um, at one point, like, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, the, the Hitler guy is like, like he goes and he's like, okay, I'm going to invade, uh, I'm going to go invade Russia. And Stalin's like, ha, you have underestimated just how many people I have and how little I care about them. (laughs) <laughs> yep. Mhm. There was also another big. There was also another big thing because um, I don't want to do, just put this all on strategy. Uh, or you know, you had mentioned earlier that uh, we need to be building these structures. I think, and I, and I wrote this in the book on the page where I found it. The one of the reasons why the Ukraine did not become the world's first anarchist nation of whatever that looks like, you know, um, you know, a, a, a larger. Ukrainian free territory enduring as long as, you know, uh, another like modern nation state or something. Um, It was largely because after the defeat, so Makhno got his forces whittled down to about 7,000. And and that's when he had the whole Helm's Deep moment and, and crushed the White Army for the first time. After that, his rank swelled to about 80,000. Yeah. And I mean, like they, they had pretty much total control over Ukraine. They went cracked open the banks and were just handing money to like needy people. They like had a whole thing and they were ruling, you know, ruling, but they were ruling in such a way that like, you know, when the peasants came up to them, assuming that they're their new bosses, you know, they're just like, no, you know, we came to, we came to uh, free you from the reds and the whites. You figure out how you want to run your society, you know? Um, the biggest problem there was that a typhoid out- outbreak happened. And the typhoid outbreak took the Machnavis forces down from 80,000 to like less than 20,000. Um, I think maybe even as low as like 17 or something. Now you got to. Yeah, exactly. Well, and not only that, but like, you know, when the Red Army betrayed them uh when the red army betrayed them i guess the first time yeah. i think it was the fir- uh, the the red army had a very weird relationship with Machno. um but when they like betrayed them like the first time um you know they they had been knocked down to about 20,000 and you know the red army in the north had been largely spared that so they had 500 600,000 soldiers they could call upon they were conscripts you know they but still you know you got that many people you said and then and when they attacked and started like disarming Machnavist units and massacring the ones that resisted Machno was like in a 10 day coma from typhoid like so yeah. So, I mean, it was completely disrupted. And so, like I said in the book, I was like, okay, one of the most important things for any anarchist movement, sanitation. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that they were dirty. I don't think they were. But I, I don't think anyone was waiting for that kind of disease outbreak to hit, which they probably should have been just because of all of the dead from that war. You know, they were plenty of typhus outbreaks, you know, in, in the United States after, after and during the civil war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think you're a thousand percent right. Um, it, that struck me as coming from a good place, but being uh, a, a bit too clueless. I think also it's probably just a bit from, you know, the the Ukrainian anarchists did not have, you know, it's like Makhno said, they, they didn't have as deep roots among the peasantry. Like, anarchism as a philosophy and way of living, like, it is... It does grow from the pe from the peasantry, and like it doesn't surprise me. Like I was looking at my family history after my son was born, um, and I found like some documents that my grandmother had written, and I found out that like you know the my mother's side of my family, you know, we were peasants in the Carpathian Mountains, and I'm just like, yeah, okay, that tracks. <laughs> so like anarchism and peasant traditions, like they really go hand in hand, and now yeah. And in our world right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honestly, I think that's one of the reasons why so many um, Americans uh, kind of naturally gravitate in the sort of right-wing libertarian direction. Um, that and, you know, just ginormous amounts of Koch brothers' money and propaganda that that buys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I should add, even if you were Elon Musk, you would not be happy. Because, look, Elon Musk is not a happy guy. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm.
Yeah. I, I, I like to think that everyone is savable, and even if they're not, that you should probably still come from that direction. But yeah, what I'll say about fascists is, in my experience, fascists are bullies, and all bullies are cowards. And they will fold, you know, in the face of any level of of overwhelming force not even you know so uh, you know there a lot was made about the um you know the richard spencer taking that punch um you know you need to physically or, or no, no, sorry not physically the opposite of that <laughs> you need to hypothetically bloody their nose in um <laughs> in minecraft yeah yeah Metaphorically, that was what I meant to say. Metaphorically. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I think a lot of people that get pulled in that like heavily reactionary uh, direction, you know, a lot of them are, you know, one, they're products of extremely authoritarian parenting styles. A lot of them have been abused. You know, the, the, you, you got to understand, like, you know, you, you, you kick a dog enough time that's going to start snapping. Um, and, you know, they you, you can get to a point where you're so deep in that ideology which in my opinion uh, is pretty much just a death cult like where you're n you're not going to come out of that unless something very serious changes about your life um and even then like you'll you'll probably be a dick just because you know when people when people are abused that pain goes on to create more pain and they replicate those patterns and you know if you get into a bad enough uh i guess uh death spiral you know it, it keeps going until eventually you know um uh, people start actually dying which which is horrifying and that's why that process needs to be arrested as quickly as possible and like with the police at occupy wall street you know you show up with 2,000 people, you know, who are ready to stand there in solidarity with each other, they will back down, you know. Um, it, it's just a matter of people having the will and the revolutionary consciousness to do something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh shit Yeah. Yep.
<laughs> yeah. I mean, so with me, uh, I, I honestly end up uh, much more on sort of the Tolstoyan... Um, uh, side of things. I'm also, I'm a big, I'm a Buddhist and I'm a big fan of Alan Watts. And I think part of what we need to be doing is not simply having the physical stuff, you know, that's important, you know, um, but also there just, there needs to be a change in like revolutionary consciousness. Um, my, my Buddhist sect talks about human revolution constantly. Um, and I, I'm not going to say that it's like the, change yourself, change the world, you know, thing. Cause that's a, that's a cliche and it do, and it very much, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's overstated. And I think a lot of the time it's just a way to get people to stop doing things to make their life, their lot in life better. But, you know, at the same time also, it is really important to, you know, change the way that you view yourself and your place within society and, you know, your, your neighbors to get out of the, sort of the egotistical thinking that, you know, Alan Watts says, you know, it's the idea that we're, um, a, a, a we're a soul wrapped up in a bag of skin, you know? <laughs> um, I, I really think that it, when people begin to recognize that they are not simply themselves, but they are also themselves and their environment existing simultaneously, you know, that, pushes you in a very constructive revolutionary headspace, you know, because it, I would have to get into like a big long Buddhist thing about it. So I'm, I'm not going to, but my, my point is, is that, you know, people get frustrated and they think that they can force this new world to be born, you know, uh, you know, through only their own efforts, you know, and that's just simply not the case. And, you know, one of the big things is, is that, you know, in the longest time in the United States, uh, the labor movement was there and really it got destroyed, you know, in the, uh, during the Red Scare, um, you know, but for the longest time, you know, you, you had the Wobblies, you had Eugene Debs, you had stuff like the Battle of Blair Mountain, you know, the Coal Wars, all of this stuff that was happening, you know, in Europe was also happening in the United States. You know, the, the biggest difference, I think, was simply that um, the United States did not have a, a great deal of revolutionary consciousness. And when that revolutionary consciousness was built up, it was then systematically destroyed in much the same way that, you know, Occupy was systematically destroyed. Just, you know, they had a much harder time putting down, like, the entire labor movement. And it really took everything from the New Deal to, um, you know, the, the horrors uh, that had been release that became well known um it's interesting by the way also you mentioned that uh mao had a, had a higher regard for the peasantry and that's very true um and like one of the things that Machno says in the second issue of deruti which is another one of his direct quotes was that like it he, he literally said like you know if, if we had you know had the luxury of better allies um you know we blacks could have saved the Russian people. We could have prevented years of hunger by avoiding pointless, uh, you know, conflicts between workers and peasants. That's very much the case. And, you know, you talk about the Holo Holodomor, um, you know, the Ukraine became a occupied, colonized people that were used to feed the workers in the cities and, you know, the Bolsheviks had all of their emphasis on the industrial proletariat and cared very, very little about the peasants, both in terms of, you know, their basic personhood, but also in their ability to run their own farms and lives and to do the thing that they've been doing since time immemorial. And of course, you know, you wind up with a massive, um, you know, completely unnecessary, uh, you know, um, uh, famine. It, it, it's it, it's the same thing. It, it, it's like the the Russian lefty version of like the British East India Company, like in India, overthrowing centuries of you know agrarian uh, political structures and organizations to just simply extract as much wealth and power from India as possible. And I mean, that led to I think just in one year, ten percent of the whole Indian subcontinent starved. Like, yeah. So, so I guess my point is, is that, um, it is really important for 
people within society, especially if you find yourself in a, in a more elite style position, to have more regard for the people that do the work to actually keep you fed, you know? Uh, and then sadly, it's one of the things that happens when people get really rich and powerful. They just, they just lose that part of themselves. No, yeah, I mean, you were just sitting there talking about how, you know, uh, people in, uh, you, know, in a, you know, rural areas and fly over states and stuff, you know, the, the stereotype is, you know, they're all these like Trump loving, um, you know, uh, sycophants. It, it's just not true. Um, you know, there, you know, you get into certain areas, um, you know, there's when me and my wife uh, before 20, we got married, I think, uh the spring before, or no, was it October? Yeah. Okay. So it was right before Trump um, came on. Cause I remember watching like his third debate with Hillary while I was on my, um, uh, my honeymoon with her. And, you know, you, you go through certain parts of like Ohio and stuff and, you know, they've got, you know, all the, the boards, you know, like the big pro Trump barns painted that way and the giant signs. I recently drove to Iowa and some weirdo had set up a series of signs, like small signs on the roadside, trying to have an argument about gun control <laughs> with me as I drove through. And I'm just watching this and I'm thinking like, you know, that really stands out. But also you got to think, who is the kind of person that's going to have the idea to do that? The money to do that, and like, like, and the the very fact they have to set up these signs shows that they are not in lockstep. You know, it's um in much the same way that like um you know if a society has a whole bunch of rules and laws, that is a direct result of the society having a great deal of you know I, I guess corruption and law breaking, and if a society doesn't have to have that that tends to mean that, you know, things are much more functional because they don't have to be. So, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, when you encounter propaganda, either in the form of memes or television or some weirdo setting up signs every 15 feet for a mile or two. Could you try again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah de i'll say probably an interesting person <laughs> mm-hmm <laughs> Um, I just accidentally had Siri talking to me because they thought I was saying something to them. So that might have cut me off. Was it that they couldn't hear you or couldn't hear me? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm having fun, but I, I definitely don't want to take up too much of your time. And I, I've got a con to get ready for. So, um, I
Mm-hmm. Perfect. I'll plug my pluggables. Um, so first of, by the way, thank you so much, Anark. I've, I've been following your work. Um, it, it's great that uh, we met through BZ. <laughs> um, you know, he's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and I remember when he first told me about you, I was like, okay, let's look this guy up. And I was like, okay, yeah, he's legit. <laughs> so... I really appreciate this. So, guys, um, I do a lot of stuff. You can follow me on YouTube, uh, where you will find I do uh, political uh, philosophy, Buddhism. I talk about Buddhism sometimes. Uh, I tend to have uh, debates with weirdo right wingers. Um, if that's your thing, you know, by all means, take advantage of my pain while I'm I'm confronting some of these people. Um, but also, and this is my main thing, uh, I am a writer. Specifically, um, I am a writer of comic books at this point. Uh, my series Snow White Zombie Apocalypse um, uh, was published by Scout Comics. It's in the comic stores now. And, um, you know, it, we've gotten two Ringo Award nominations. Like, you know, the, the my book was up there with, like, you know, books by, like, freaking Stan Sakai and Neil Gaiman <laughs> in some of these categories. Um, so, like, you know, I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm not winning this, and I am totally fine with it. Um, at the moment, I am doing m one of my favorite series, uh, Darudi's Shadow of the People. The, the first and second issue have been funded on Kickstarter. The first one's out. The second one will be out very soon. I am currently running a special um, campaign uh, specifically on Indiegogo to benefit Razom for Ukraine. It's a charity that engages in cultural uh, work and life-saving life mutual aid on the ground in Ukraine. Um, they are, you know, they're, they're, they're a liberal organization, but um, I, I try not to hold that too much against them. Um, and they're, they're a very high rated charity. So, you know, that like the work that the, the work that they're doing is helping the people who, regardless of your perspective on the conflict, no, none of them asked for this and are living one of the worst things that a human being can ever have to deal with. So if you pledge to that Indiegogo, and if you can't pledge, please share it. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different levels. We have a little less than 10 days to go, and we have a little under $1,000 still left to get funded. When we do get funded, 30% is going to go straight to Raison, and they're going to be putting that into um, mutual aid efforts on the ground, specifically um, helping Ukrainian civilians who have been injured and displaced by this war. So you can get an awesome freaking comic, uh, where you can learn about Buenaventura de Rudy uh, from a writer that people apparently like my work. <laughs> um, you know, so it's a great keepsake. And you, by the way, the, the cover for this issue, which is uh, unique to this, is absolutely badass. It is, it is Nestor Machno um, doing what he does best, which is gunning down white soldiers with a tachanka. So definitely check that out. Um, yeah, you can follow me, uh, Google my name, Brenton Lengel. I'm at Brenton Lengel on Twitter. YouTube, I'm at The Friendly Anarchist. Um, and I, I think an arc has a link in the thing. And just go, if you want to find the Indiegogo, uh, either follow the link below or just go on Indie, uh, Indiegogo and uh, type in D-U-R-R-U-T-I and you, you'll find it. Um, do, do not wait though. Um, because with this, like if we hit the 1500, we get the money. If we don't hit the 1500, nothing happens. So I, I really want to make sure we can hand over at least $500, uh, to go towards uh, mutual aid, uh, in Ukraine. Um, all right. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Anark. That, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I get excited about shit and just kind of disappear into it for a little while. <laughs> Thank you for letting me just, you know, nerd out about this. Speak. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and if people are wanting to see some practical real world, world things to, to do with anarchism, um, I, I highly, I always recommend this. This is one of the films that was critical uh, to me, uh, you know, uh, being radicalized or, uh, you know, realizing that socialism and anarchism were not horrifically evil and insane things, you know, because as a, you know, I was raised as a red blooded American male and 
one of the big things that led to me becoming an anarchist was arguing with anarchists online. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I uh, yeah I was I was arguing uh, with some people in like a freaking goth forum. And I realized midway through the argument that anarchism was not what I thought it was and that I would need to research it to win the argument. So I went, I researched it, I learned what anarchism was, I came back, I won the argument, and then like six months later I was like, ah, shit. <laughs> they were right the entire time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, you guys can find me. Um, I, I you know I do a bunch of crazy arts stuff. Uh, I'm going to be at Chattanooga Comic Con this weekend. That's what I'm getting ready for. Uh, if you are there, come by the booth. I'm going to be there with Scout Comics. Uh, you can get a signed copy of Derudi Number One. Um, and, and please, everyone who can, you know, if just ten people go in and do a hundred dollars, we're already going to hit that. If you don't have that much money on, on, on hand, I totally understand it. You know, you can get the series in, digitally for like five bucks. And if you have no money, but you still want to help out, a share, it, it really, even one share will boost us in uh, Indiegogo's algorithms. And that will translate to more people seeing the campaign and will hit our goal. So, yeah, thank you all very much. And thank you, Anark. Um, yeah, and I, I look forward. Let's, uh, let's talk again sometime soon. All right. Catch you later. Bye. All right. Let's look and see if I'm still on. Uh... Ah. Oh, cool. Hey, we've got people there. Hail chat. Hey, it's the force. It's the first world uh, thing. Hey. If people are still watching me. Oh, yeah. It does say that I'm still streaming. Um. I guess you guys are just uh, checking out my screen right now, which thanks to OBS is, you know, doing the thing. I'm just going to bring this up here for the Indiegogo. Um, come on. There we go. Um, so if you guys are still watching, uh, like I said, as you can see, we've got $515 to go. We just need to do another, uh, like, just 1000 And uh, we need to do that in 10 days. It can be done, you know, but I just don't have any presence on Indiegogo. So any help that you guys can do, that that would be absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, First World Comic, if you're still uh, still here, I, I really enjoyed reading your first issue. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the review that I did with um, uh, what, T Jump. Yeah, it was with T Jump. Um, yeah, so definitely uh, check us out and, and best of luck. Uh, I, I look forward to your next issue. Um, and uh, let's see, is anybody still there, or have people have people disappeared? Because uh, I'm not seeing any any comments. Um, if people have disappeared, then I, I guess I will stop streaming. So uh, someone come in here. Uh, hey, hi, Brenton. Very intriguing respect from a Putin ally. Hmm. I, I are you an ally or I don't know. Somebody said sprays troll be gone. <laughs> uh, be in the hive. I I love having you around here. Uh, thank you very much, Siri. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm gonna stop streaming and start getting ready for the con. Um, I will catch you guys later. <laughs>